Entrepreneurs will save the world. We chat with successful entrepreneurs who share their journey and the lessons learned along the way. The Add Value to Entrepreneurs podcast is edutaining, leaving you with actionable advice to transform your life and create a thriving business that aligns with your values and goals. Our conversations are for entrepreneurs who want more freedom and fulfillment from their work so they can live the life they desire. We focus on the mindset shifts entrepreneurs make to increase their influence and impact in the world. It's time for you to add value. This episode is brought to you by Perfect Publishing. Perfect Publishing is a different approach to publishing a book. Perfect Publishing is sharing a project of hope called The Dose of Hope. We carefully chose heroes of hope who exemplify living a life they created through faith, hope, patience, and persistence. No matter what page you open to in this mini cube of hope, you will find a leader with a big heart. You will see you are not alone. The authors may share similar challenges that only hope and action could resolve. Get your free ebook at addvalue2life.com slash dose. Add value to life.com slash dose. Our guest today is Trent Clark. Trent is the CEO of Leadershipity, having spent his adult livelihood among top 1% producers in sports and business. Trent is dedicated to empowering people to reach their goals, peak performance, and attain their dreams. Labeled the dream maker, having started 12 businesses and a 10 plus year EO member, his dedication and energy given to his teams and the entrepreneurs he works with is so infectious. But most folks know Trent for his 12 plus years in Major League Baseball and coaching in three World Series. Trent Clark and Robert have a great conversation about the itties, ability, capacity, mentality, productivity, and other big itties. We talk about pro athletes being hyper achievers and what is the business equivalent to getting in the reps. It's important to have high expectation because you play to the level you expect. Winners find a way. And losers have many traits in common. Well, Trent, thank you for joining me today. I'm looking forward to this conversation and just excited to uh, to, to learn from you today. Excited to be here, Robert. Thanks for having me. It's great. So I you're you're in a unique position because I'm I come to entrepreneur coaching from a spiritual side, from a ministry side, but I've always been fascinated about the similarities between physical development of our body, health health wise and personal development of our mind and how how similar those processes can be and so you come from the 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 physical conditioning world and now you're you're in the leadership coaching world and so i'm just looking forward to to learning how you yeah. tied those two together and then yeah. the other aspect is is sports coaching versus leadership coaching and, yes. and those two kinds of dynamics. And so I'm looking forward to, to, to this conversation, but typically I let everyone just start off with uh, their own entrepreneurial journey and, and what got you to, you know, running your own business. Yeah. So really appreciate that, Robert. And you're right. I think there's like your show, you talk about holistic approach, you know, the spiritual is so important and uh, you know, spirituality is one of those big itties and, you know, we, we want our leaders to focus on that. Right. And from a holistic perspective, it's uh, there's a lot of dynamics that are very similar in those three things, right? In your health, in your sport, in your business, you know, how that works. So i um, super excited to, to be aboard. And uh, for me, I'm a Michigan kid, uh, born and raised there and uh, left pretty early, uh, played Division One baseball and tennis at Toledo and then headed off, got a job with the Tigers coaching there, coached at Michigan State, did some grad work there. And then off to uh, Cleveland, where I started my first company. I was coaching for the uh, Cleveland Indy. My first business was uh, creating gyms for people's homes, right? And so that was like my first real uh, entrepreneurial venture. Um, I did have a personal training business, but that was kind of like a sole proprietorship. Um, and so this was uh, this was new. And I've started, uh, I think, 13 cents. So. Oh, I'm a serial entrepreneur looking for opportunities and ideas all the time. Love, uh, love, love teams, love partnerships. They haven't always gone perfect, but I, I do love uh, being on a team. So it's been enjoyable. Entrepreneur organization. I've got that mentorship hat on today. And that's a big organization I've been involved with for a lot of years, almost uh, 11 now. And uh, so a lot of good things that I've learned. And man, the trials of entrepreneurship is a, is a trial in itself, right? <laughs> Yeah, but the I think the reward 
right? The, the reward for passing through those things it far outweighs the, the, the challenges. Yeah, I think so. I think if you if it didn't, nobody would do it, right? <laughs> like, like nobody would want to think like, oh my goodness, like if, if you made the exact same money, had the exact same schedule, and you were required to be somewhere at all those times, um, yeah, I think that most people would be like, wow, I'm just going to work for somebody else because this is <laughs> way too much responsibility and way too much chaos. Absolutely. So so let's talk through, um, obviously, you know, um, as a strength and conditioning coach, um, your focus is obviously developing the body. And then now on the side, now you, you start a side hustle, developing the mind and, and leadership. Um, let's talk about how those two kind of work together. Yeah. So for me, I think the physical is always what everybody goes to when you talk about exercise physiology and things, but I think there's a ton of mental, right? From <laughs> my perspective, being physically prepared, advancing faster than other people, looking physically strong, all those things were playing a role into my mentality and my mental strength for sure. Um, going through hard things, hard training sessions, building up perseverance and durability, I think is really important. I'm also a big John Wooden fan. I, I think <laughs> training has a lot to do with uh, physical conditioning, mental conditioning, but I think if we if we neglect that spiritual side and moral conditioning, there's a holistic side there that really gets missed. And it's a huge tripwire for entrepreneurs, leaders, professional athletes. When we see people really take that big fall <laughs> and it goes right to the front of the media, you know, a lot of time it's a, it's the moral conditioning that fell out. Almost always. Yeah. In business, in business and in sport. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of physical fallouts with athletes too, but um, with injuries and all those things, but mental fallouts. I mean, there there are a lot. And uh, so that holistic approach, I think, is so important. So I felt like I've always been training those three things all the time. And I think one of those things that was really intrinsic to me was I'm a five, six at, at, at max kind of uh, ability. I was probably like that 170, 175 pound range, like. No one's looking at me and thinking pure dominance, right? <laughs> this is not like a physical specimen that is, I was working hard to compete. So I'm finding mental edges, moral conditioning edges. Those became edges uh, over other people. And when I look back and think about, you know, world championships, you know, I coached in three world championships in, in professional baseball. And when I really look at that sustainability of athletes through it, that spirituality was so important because that moral conditioning became a discipline that they knew they had to have. And that discipline carried over to their mental training, that discipline carried over to their physical training. And so they were always very diligent about preparation and doing the things very focused and also um, take away a lot of the temptation Island, because if you're focused and disciplined, you know, you're not out running around going, Oh, I'd love to, I should have got to my workout. But, you know, Robert and I went out till four last night. <laughs> like, wait, what? Like, man, you know, I know, now I know why you missed your 8 a.m. workout, right? But if, if we have that discipline that has that really developed, you know, a lot through our spirituality, right? Um, then all of a sudden, hey, I'm, I'm doing my study. I'm, I'm getting my body down at 1030. I'm getting up at 830. I'm getting food in my body ready to go and maximize my time for my eight, for my 9 a.m. workout, you know? And so- we're, um, you know, you see people that really understand and get that because they do understand that holistic approach. Well, and I think it's even, it's, it's knowing what's important, right? Yeah. Having, having a clear understanding of what you value, what is it that you really want? Right. And, and we've all seen athletes that, that, that get lost in that and they don't know. Right. And you talked about temptation Island. I think all business failures, if you look at business, all business failures and all, athletes that have fallen from grace and of course politicians that have fallen from grace are all moral failures they're they're not they're not that they're bad business people they made a bad business choice and that that brings them down no that it's a moral choice that they made they let go of their values and 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 that's brought them down you know and 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 currently you know the greatest pitcher in baseball is now suspended for two years because of a moral failure and and whether or not it, it was as extreme as he's, you know, he's pretending, well, it was just normal. And and of course the world is saying, no, that's extreme, but it was a value proposition, right? He, he, his values were that this, <laughs> this activity was more important in the moment than, 
than baseball. And I think, I think for entrepreneurs, especially getting their core values down, knowing what's really important to them, and then putting those boundaries around those things. And, and, and you, you described athletes that they understand that, that the game is more important, right? The practice is necessary. The, the 8 a.m. workout is necessary. And, and if I party all night, that 8 a.m. workout is going to be a drag, right? And so yeah. I choose to focus on the 8 a.m. workout because that's where my value is. That's what's more important to me. Um, for sure. So I think that's a, I think it's a for sure point. And I think it, 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 it becomes a challenge at all levels, right? <laughs> and it's not bad people. It's a lot of good people making bad choices. And um, that becomes a real, you know, evidence. And I, and I don't think, you know, and I think you, you've hit on something really important, which is when you have that value system, you have that aligned, you're talking about that, you're, 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 you're directing your teams based on that. And you're holding people accountable, including yourself to that higher standard and modeling that. I think that's so important. And what's happening is that we don't go running away from what's right you know, we're on the drift. Right. And, you know, I, I always want people surrounding me that will catch my drift because I'll drift too. Right. Uh, there's, you know, times that, Hey, I'd like to be spending more time in the jam or more time in the word, more time in my, you know, personal holiness and practicing at that. That's important. And, and more time in my physical preparation and all, all those things. And it doesn't take much. Right. And so we, I always use the example of, you know, a pilot gets in a plane, he's going to take, you know, Robert and Trent from LA to New York, and he's one click of a degree off. Well, we land in DC, right? <laughs> like, so that's a huge drift. Like in that next four and a half, five hours, right? We're like, Hey, uh, we got meetings in Manhattan. Like what, you know, what's, I don't know what we're going to do in DC. Like, you know, and I don't think Joe wants to take our meeting. So, you know, like, so what are we going to do? So, um, it's, it's an absolute, those little things. And so having people around to be like, Hey, that, that, that's a little off. And I think that's why people need those coaches. They need people that are around them to help, you know, get those guide rails. And I think you use a good word is, is boundaries are really important. Well, absolutely. I, you know, for me in ministry, it, it was a kind of a requirement to put a boundary around my relationship with my wife and, and make decisions that, that, that protect that. And then the leadership of of the ministries that I was involved in reinforced those boundaries and, and honored us in, in keeping those boundaries, you know, never taking a woman, you know, in a, in the car for a ride, never meeting women alone in your office and, and, and these kinds of, you know, quote unquote rules, but they were really boundaries to, to protect us from the drift. Yeah. And, and, and I like what you mentioned, you know, having somebody to catch my drift, and and that's that means that you've got those close relationships, the the relationships with people that that are watching your drift, and that are willing to you know tap you on the shoulder and say, "Hey, dude, I think you're I think you're sliding down a road you don't want to go down." Yeah, and I think you see that right in men's ministry, like uh, and any ministry, but really men to men, it's um, you know you get to know someone, you understand, hey, this is my value system, and all of a sudden you see a couple signs of changing that value, whether it's loose language or changing their appearance and, you know, coming in 20 minutes late to service and, you know, disheveled, you know, whatever's happening, you could see a lot of telltale signs that are saying, Hey, um, or, you know, you get feedback through somebody else like, Oh yeah, listen, I picked up my daughter from work the other day at one o'clock and I saw Trent coming out of the bar. <laughs> You're like, wow, <laughs> Hey, I, I might need to call Trent. Like, Hey, what's up, man? Like this doesn't sound like you. So, so walk me through what, what's, what's going on, right? That's, that's just catching the drift, man. Like uh, we, we need some accountability, which is, you know, one of those idiots, it's a four letter word now, right? Like, and it's like, wait a minute, you know, accountability is a great thing. And uh, unfortunately it's got a pretty bad rap in the public right now. Yeah. So let's talk about the difference between, so obviously players had to submit to coaches in, in, in some way, right? I mean, obviously, you're, you're put in a position above the players in, in regards to their, you know, strength and conditioning so that they needed to listen to you. But there's also the idea of, of wanting to develop a relationship that says, Hey, I care about you. I've got your back and I want the very best for you. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I was ever above anybody, right? <laughs> like, you know, it's, a, it is a position of authority, right? That's a, that's a pretty important idiot. Like, 
hey, I am in a position of authority. I have got a lot of responsibility around that. One of the critical things for me was to help players understand that our mission is aligned. Um, and, and so the relationships building on a lot of things to help them get to where they want to go on their personal goals, on what they're setting for themselves. And so I think those are, are really huge things. Now I had boundaries too, you know, like I'm not, you know, uh, fraternizing with players and there's a limit, like happy to go to lunch, happy to go to breakfast, happy to go to dinner. We can break bread and have meals together, but you know, I don't go out to the clubs with players. I don't do some of the social things that they would do. And with their peers. And that's great. And it's their time to be together. It's not time to be commingling in my opinion. So that was, you know, pretty important to me. And, uh, you know, I, I think there's other, you know, a factor about that that we touched on a little earlier, which is where people go astray. And, you know, when you get someone who's really good at reaching their goals, like, like pro athletes who are hyper learners, right. And they go, you know, Hey, all, all, all they want is a college scholarship and they get that. And then, Hey, if I could get all conference and man, if I could be an all American and you know, my next goal is to get a draft, be a draftee and go to the, you know, pro sports. And then if I could make double a before I'm 22, and then if I could get a big league contract before I'm 23 or 24, if I could get, you know, a, a multi-year contract and it, it, they keep stepping these goals. Right. And then it's, Hey, if I could get a, a long term, if I could win a championship, there is a point where goals kind of run out, right? Like it's like, man, like if we, if we leave it to ourselves, like, ah, there's nothing left for me to do, but you know, take coming back to that holistic approach of like, Hey, goals for me to be a dad goals for me to be a father goals for me to be a teammate goals for me to be, you know, physically ready goals for me to be coachable and have that coachability. That is one of those big itties. that's so important. You know, those things, they, you know, people lose that when they're 34, 35, and they've gone through the ringer. They've got all the 10,000 hours in the world. They're absolutely experts. And, you know, I'm, I'm great at everything. Just ask me, right? <laughs> like, <so it's> like, <laughs> you know, like, they're doing all the talking and there's no more listening. And so, um, you know, when, when, when I used to tell players, and this is very good for people in any workspace, you know, when they stop talking to you, the end is near. Because they consider you no longer coachable. Your coachability is zero. And they feel like, well, I could try, you know, Robert could try to help Trent, but you're, you're, you're tired of, you know, you've just wasted enough oxygen on Trent. He's not listening. He has it. He shuts me off. He interrupts me. He, he turns his back on me. You know, every time we talk about this, he poo poos it. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, but is always the first response. Oh yeah. But Robert, that's great. Yeah, but uh, my, my dad says I should do it this way. Yeah, but, you know, uh, my wife's not going to let me do that. <laughs> what? Like, what? Like, there's some crazy responses. But at the end of the day, all of it is is deemed not coachable, not looking to improve, probably as good as it's going to get. And so the moment it goes backwards and it's not good enough, first first one-way ticket out. Hmm. Yeah, the, the, the yeah buts are definitely a symptom of – of either limiting beliefs or ego, right? Yeah. Typically for, for me, it's, you know, yeah, but you don't understand my situation. Yeah, but I'm unique and this is, you know, um, and, and so the, the yeah, buts are definitely, it's a known word in, in our world that's, that's a sure sign of, of negative things. Yeah, and, and it also may be, you know, it's a telltale sign for sure, but it may simply be someone close to them giving you know, maybe not great advice. Like they are leading on uh, a mentor or an advisor who's giving them information that nobody else agrees with, um, but they have that trust level with that person. And so um, it just may be a bad choice of personnel that you're getting and the words are coming in and, and they might just be listening to the wrong person or, or, or reading the wrong book. Right. <laughs> yeah. When it, when it comes to money mindset, it's always, it's always their uncle Joe who, you know, is giving them their financial advice. And, and then you ask, well, how's uncle Joe doing? And that, you know, he lives in a trailer park. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so right. why are we, why are we listening to uncle Joe? <laughs> yeah. There's like, there's not the financial means to be giving that advice. And that's, that's often um, a lot of folks. Right. And, and they, they, re we really teach kids early on 
to be very aware of where people are. And one of my early lessons was from a coach in baseball. Um, he was the first professional coach I'd ever met and um, our professional player I'd ever met. And I was uh, 15 years old at his camp. And I was super excited about going to this camp with the best of the best. And I also recognized because of his, you know, information before the camp was if you were named the MVP, I got to sit down with the, the, the former major leaguer. And that was going to be so important to me. And I got one of these just lifelong lessons. I sat down, had the courage, you know, just to kind of say some things or ask some questions. I, I don't know why, really. I guess just blind faith, right? And um, so he asked me, you know, hey, what do you want to do? And I was like, you know, I really want to do what you did. I want to play in the majors. And, you know, he paused for a second. He said, yeah, I watched you all week. And, you know, I think you can do that. And, man, it was just it was so powerful to hear that from someone who'd been there. And, you know, I was this undersized guy who's trying to, you know, make up for that in a lot of ways. So there's a definite chip on the shoulder for sure. And my next question was the big impact because I just said, man, in all due respect, everybody else is telling me, no, you know, I'm not big enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not fast enough. And my voice in my head starting to say, Hey, Trent, you're not enough. And that's, a bad place to be. Right. And so I'm always fighting this, you know, Hey, I think I can, uh, yeah, you're not enough. Uh, you know, you just face the best in the league and you only went one for four. You're not that great. Right. And so he, he stopped me right there cold and said, let me ask you a question, Trent. Like of all these people telling, you no, did, did they play in the major leagues? Have they coached in the major leagues? I'm like, no, None of them. My guidance counselor was a football player. You know, like my mom, she she never played. You know, like all these people that immediately came to mind who who loved me and had great intention for me and and recognized that that is a small percentage of success. Um, he just immediately said, like, man, I am going to caution you on where you get advice from going forward. You should be have somebody who's actually done what you're trying to do and man, I, I started seeking people out like yourself, Robert, and, you know, very successful entrepreneurs that have been through things, successful athletes. And I sought people that had been there and asked their advice. And so I have this high radar that goes up when people go, yeah, you know what you should do, Robert, you know, you know what you should do in the ministry. <laughs> like, wait, have you, have you ever run a ministry? No, but I did say at a Holiday Inn Express last night. That's right. <laughs> no, no, no. Like, you're like, stop, right? Like, hey, thanks. I'm always pleasant. But, and and by the way, you know, you get this every day in pro sports. Like, you you walk out of, of the parking lot, of, of, of the staff parking lot, and they're like, you know, hey, Clark, keep your back elbow up. <laughs> like, like, I'm going to take hitting advice. From someone in the parking lot at 12.30 a.m., you know? There's, like, there's a lot of couch quarterbacks and a lot okay. of couch hitting coaches. Yeah. So I say, you know, <laughs> hey, listen, don't shit on me. You should do this, Trent. You should do that. And I'm not going to shit on you, you know, and that's and that's very important because I'm not qualified. I, I think there's one that's qualified to make judgment. And I know I am not a deity, so I'm, I'm going to just leave that to the people that are qualified and, and those that are because I am not. And it, it's a powerful lesson, right? Because so often we think that the judgment is like the negative things when, when you're judging, you know, when the Bible tells us not to judge, but it yeah. really is the small things that it's telling us not to judge sure. each other, not to judge, you know, appearances, not to judge based on, you know, their desires and their wishes. Now I, I do want to credit moms because, I, and I, we deal with this in the entrepreneurial world all the time, right? The, the limiting beliefs based around money and, and, you know, the risk involved in entrepreneurship and the idea, it's it's it's, it's kind of similar, right? You tell mom, I'm going to start a business. And mom goes, are you oh, sure yeah. you should do that? You know, <laughs> yeah. It's, and, yeah. And 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 for moms, it, a lot of it's that protection, right? Well, like yes. only, only, you know, one-tenth of one percent of college athletes make pro. Like, are you sure you want to, yeah. you sure you want to put yourself in that space? And, and, and mom just doesn't want you to aim too high because she doesn't want you to fall so far. Yeah. And they don't realize that by aiming so high, the chances are you're going to fall and land higher than most people try. Yeah. I think one other thing I learned from Nick Saban, you know, when I coached with Coach Saban was you know, he sets expectations very high. It, they are moonshots. And, and I loved it. I mean, you know, he was very clear. He has a lot of clarity around his high expectations. And 
many, including probably myself. I don't know if you asked Nick, you'd probably be like, yeah, Trent didn't mean it. You know, but, but I'll tell you what a lot of people do is they shoot for the moon and they land in the stars. Right. Like, ah, you know, I didn't quite meet Nick's deal, but like, yeah, you know, I did hit right on the Milky way, man. It was pretty good. <laughs> like, you know, like, and so it's, um, I see a lot of it and, uh, and, and the, the damage that I've seen from people that come in with the lowest bar of an expectation. I see people that will come up and butt up against that expectation, maybe out of personal pride and, you know, their own values, they'll exceed that a, a little bit, but no one just goes shooting past it inside the organization because what they do is they get there and then they go, wow, Trent's not letting me just moonshot this thing. There's no rocket fuel around here. I got to go over to Robert's organization and really let, you know, he's going to let me fly. And or or start my own thing, and and that I think that's so important. And I think you're exactly right with moms, by the way. I mean, moms want to see their kids happy, healthy, successful. And man, there are some dark days in entrepreneurship. And of course, everyone in the world has sat with friends and gone, you know, you know what happened to you know Janie's company, and it's like, oh my god, here comes the horror story. <laughs> and no one really talks about at the coffee shop, like, oh. Did you know Janie just created ten more million dollars in value and 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 hired twenty seven new people and you know she's just doing great. Like we don't always share in the success because the dirty laundry is kind of more the bigger story, right? Oh, so so true, man. I love I love what you're talking about with expectations, and and the idea that 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 you can dream bigger, you can you can seek higher. And, and the fact that whatever you're seeking is really the limitation you create. Yeah. And so why not put it up here and, and then get to here rather than put it down here and then, Oh, oh I just barely get past it. Yeah. Um, so it's so true of the way the human mind works and the way I think the way the team understands the goal, right? If, it, if the no team doubt. understands we got to work a little bit harder and, and we, each each member has to work a little bit harder to make this thing work. Like without without the team, none of us can make this work. And so it it takes everyone to to a higher level. And obviously, you know, Coach Saban's success proves <laughs> over and over that. Yeah. Look, if I set high expectations, then then they're gonna they're gonna meet them. Yeah. Gonna, you know his his expectations are are now standards, right? You either come in at that standard. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a different level, right? He's playing on a different, uh, a, a different level than most, um, get a chance to. So it, and it's uniquely special. And I really, I, I really cannot identify with the success that coach Saban's had. I wish I had that kind of success. The one minuscule, you know, kind of example I can use is that he is highly aware that he, he is near the top and everybody's coming to knock them off. And, you know, I played for a high school baseball team that went to three state championships. And so that's rare air because it's a one loss deal. And, um, and, and it hadn't been done prior in the state of Michigan. So, you know, when we knew we were ranked number one, my junior year after we won the state title, you know, we saw everybody's best. If we're playing Lansing, we're going to see John Smoltz. If you're playing against Taylor, you're, you're going to see uh, the, the, the kid from the Braves. I mean, like, it, it was just, you know, uh, time and time again, you know, you're seeing the best of the best because the coach goes, oh, circle it. We got this, you know, Lakeview on the schedule on April 30th. <laughs> and, hey, Tommy Gunn, bring your stuff, man, because you better be ready because that, you know, you put your best against their best and let's find out where we're at. Well, you know, Alabama's been at this for what, a decade? They've been the best for a decade and you, and, and people just keep coming to knock them off and you know, some have been successful, right? Like, but, but, but look what it's done. Look what it's done to the sec Ooh. as a, as a, as a division, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, it's, it's created teams within their, within their conference that that conference is elite now at a, yes. at a higher level because it's pulled, they've pulled each other up in that same, in that same expectation and they're leaving the rest of college football behind. It's so true. We will be right back after this short break. This episode is sponsored by the newly released book, Dream Life Planner, Move from Tired and Overwhelmed to Free and Empowered by Noel L. Peterson, 
available on Amazon, or you can order a personalized signed copy at empower, E-M-P-O-W-E-R, to dream.com. That's empower, number two, dream.com. If you enjoy the show, please like and subscribe, leave a review, tell your friends. Welcome back. Let's get back to more greatness. It is so true. And so, you know, when you think about that, you know, and I think this is part of that holistic part that you're talking about, because there's so much more to it than just the game. There's standards, there's leadership, there's development. But now you look at how many new applications of enrollment do we have at Alabama compared to a decade ago, right? The, the option of going to university there, um, the levels of their programming engineering, medical schools. I mean, it's just getting up stronger and stronger, stronger because they have more opportunities, more options. And, you know, great, great people make everybody around them better. And I mean, I love, uh, if you've seen the um, the special on the man in the arena with Tom Brady, you know, he mm-hmm. has a definition of leadership in there about episode eight or nine. And, you know, he's like, hey, you know, I'm about making people better around me. I think, you know, my body of work can speak for itself. You actually genuine care for those around you. And my goal is to have them be as good as they can be and meet their goals. And I want to know what that is for them. And, you know, they should know what ours is. But uh, ideally, you know, that whole organization is unified. And that's what's great about sports, right? We unify to go, hey, Robert, let's let's get this team and organization towards a title. And we know what that means. but you know, I think a lot of them just do like, Hey, what's, what's a championship level organization. And I, I had a good experience with the, with the Cleveland Indians in the nineties where, you know, my three years, we went to the world series twice there and there was all hands on deck to create a championship organization and a championship experience. And so the people that wiped down the seats, the ushers were very involved in creating a championship experience. Yes, it helped that the team won, but they're, they, they're, they're clearing out. If, if people are creating a bad experience around small children, hey, you need to go there, buddy. Like, it's, it's not okay here. You know, we're not having it. That's not championship. Come, enjoy the game, have a ball, have a laugh. But this language, this kind of stuff, not okay. And we've got a standard. And we draw a line in the sand. It's not okay. And I think that. When you get an organization, and Belichick, of course, one of one of Saban's good friends, and you know uh, Nick coached with Bill's dad, and they coached together, obviously in Cleveland. Uh, he, you know, Belichick says, you know, you know, you have a great organization when everyone in the organization knows their role and they're doing it right. So when you talk about this goal setting, right? In my opinion, everyone in the organization should have a goal and at least one or two of those goals should be how do they contribute to the profitability of this company, to the the direction of whatever your 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 goal is. Right. And so uh, I, I see, you know, people put in like our mission or our statement of value is to create a physical and mental experience of of gratitude and strength and uh, personal achievement for each of our customers. And so we take that back inside those organizations saying, hey, in your role, how are you contributing to Robert's mental and physical strength and personal achievement in his programming right now? Well, you know, I'm making sure the toilets are clean and everything here is pristine because when everybody comes through, we want them to have a good experience. Like, that's great for me. That That is the answer because if that's your role here, you are doing a fabulous job. The place shines and keep it up, right? Well, and and everyone has a role. Absolutely. Well, and so much of what you're mentioning is is so important because the teams that win championships, they understand how important the janitor is, how important the, the team nurse is, how important the strength and conditioning coach is. And it's not just the egos on the on the playing field. Yeah. And it's and and I think the 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 greatness of Tom Brady is not in his ability as a quarterback. The greatness in Tom Brady is in his ability as a leader. Oh, yeah. And, and he recognizes I can't play this game alone. Yeah. And <laughs> still playing at a pretty high level. Right. And, and, and surrounding himself um, with people uh, that he's supporting and they're supporting him. 
And I mean, that's last time I looked, that's a pretty good recipe for success there. And uh, it, it is amazing when you think about, you know, his longevity in it and organizations can learn a lot. Obviously businesses have, and businesses and organizations can learn a lot from quality championship level caliber organizations because they're, they're run well. And uh, it, it is so important for organizations to actually grasp the importance of every person's role in contribution. And I, I do see a lot of organizations that miss it. They don't <laughs> define uh, roles and responsibilities very well, which is funny to me, right? Because we all have job applications. And Robert, you say, hey, this is what we need in our ministry today. And it's like, you're going you're gonna to be doing uh, finance, you know, the P&L, uh, AP, AR, like we, we, we need to keep the balance, you know, obviously budget and finance is very important in a ministry and organization. We, we want to stay in the black, right? That's, that's pretty important when, you know, any organization goes in the red, never good, including ministry. Right. So, you know, as we track that, it's like, oh, I've got here, I'm, you know, a CPA, a qualified, um, yeah, Robert, what do you need me to do? Uh, you want, you want to change the water? Like, it, no, I, I want you to look at AR and AP, right? Like, like I want you to be very focused on what this role, and yet uh, I see all the time organizations like people that don't know their role, and I and I see that they um, or they're aware of the role, uh, and here was the job description, and of those eight things, they're doing five or six really well, and the well, other they're kind of either neglecting. Or they're delegating out to the wrong person, um, and it's not getting done. And, and, and so, then it's yeah, the, the typical job description is built on tasks, and they're they're all the, the task focus. And 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 the worst thing is if you you talk to them and they say, "Well, I'm just the accountant." Yeah, yeah, I'm just the accountant. You know, in the church, we repeatedly said the janitor is the most important person on our staff because if the bathrooms are dirty, no one's coming back. Yep. Not even the people that love us are coming back if the bathrooms are gross. And yep. and you could you could have a bad sermon, you could even have a bad worship, and people be like, I'll give it another try. Mm. But you have a dirty bathroom, they're not Isn't coming that back. Funny. Like, you know, you think like that's kind of elementary, right? And you know, we talk about it in football. Like for me in the youth program, like our center is the number one person. Like nothing starts without us getting the ball, right? Like we can't start anything going until that person does their job and never gets any accolades, right? Like it's just never like, Hey, wow. Um, super job hiking the ball 78 times without a fumble today. Right. Like, and no one's ever, no one, we just gloss over it. Like, Hey, that's just your job. Right. But if that job's not done, like nothing goes well. Right. Absolutely. It's so important. So, so let's chat a little bit about connection because you've mentioned i mean obviously relationships are, are really really important and you've mentioned some really cool mentor relationships and you know, relationships between between players um and and staff but let's talk about you know the human connection and the need for human connection at at that this level to grow ourselves and and become excellent Sure. Let's talk about that. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of uh, requirement there. Um, and, you know, I think all human relationships are primarily built on trust, right? At least good relationships. Um, and, you know, I think, I think one thing in relationship is, is um, sometimes relationships aren't always perfect and people don't always see eye to eye. And I, I really don't find that to be horrible inside an organization what I do find absolutely uh, a critical requirement is respect. Mm -hmm. And, you know, trust is going to be one of those key things that we need. Um, and I think one of the things that, that gets tripped up in leadership is a person's desire to be liked over being respected. Mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult to be liked by everybody in your organization and making very challenging uh, last line of defense decisions, right? Um, you know, I find out that most people probably are disagreeing at about 44%, right? Like we, we do have a majority, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty, uh, diplomatic and, and democratic here in, in our country. So we think like, Oh, Hey, we, I've got the majority thinking that we can get aligned behind this, but 
there is still a significant amount, amount of folks that will not agree with leadership's decisions. And so, you know, if, if you've got this uh, veiled skin that, hey, I've got to be liked, um, that's going to be really challenging in organizations sometimes because, um, you know, it, it's not always simple. It's not always easy. Uh, but carrying yourself uh, and being aligned in those values, treating people with respect, you know, kind of following those values across the board and always showing those um, can be the key element to actually keeping people in alignment and uh, and, and keeping people in relation too, um, because we model that. Even though I may not feel like, well, you know, Wendy and I always don't see eye to eye. We send a degree, we debate. So, hey, that's fine. You know, we may not have much of a social relation, but there's a, but there's a genuine respect for Wendy's experience and what she's done. And, and, and in our debate, she can show that respect to me and I can return that. And we can agree to disagree because we have a level of, of trust in that we both want the same thing. We are both working our roles for the same contribution in the end for the organization. So, I mean, it's, that's really about vision, right? Knowing where the organization's going knowing that you both have a purpose in serving the organization. And I think when people get lost in that and relationships start to break down is they, they've lost sight of a destination. They've lost yeah. sight of, of, of a purpose that can be aligned. And now it becomes a, a, a struggle of power and control. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a lot of different things that will break down, right? Motivation, social things change. Um, there's so many things that can come in like everything, right? Like there's always a, uh, there's always distractions to take our eyes off the ball, right? And it's very easy to do. It's actually staggeringly easy to, for an organization to lose focus. And even, um, you know, one or two can be very influential in that loss, right? So um, when we have team members that aren't in that alignment, they are not focused. They are creating division or disagreement across the lines and, that soon bleeds into complaint, uh, criticism, you know, all, all the three C's that we don't want to see. And, 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 and of course, all of it, both of it is, is highly contagious. We can mm. be very focused and value oriented and, and respectful, and that's contagious. Or we can be highly critical, um, you know, offering plenty of complaints and we can be contentious over everything. And that will also be highly contagious. Hmm. So there's a there's a powerful. How do you how do you help turn that negative to to a positive? Yeah, I mean, it really it really is critical that leadership understands their role in providing that standard, um, and and also uh, we come back to accountability, holding that standard for other people. You know, one of the things in our organization that's not allowed is there's no complaining allowed. Like there's not a lot. Like I, I, I do. And like all my leaders in the organization, they have to hold that standard. Now that doesn't mean Robert, that you can't come to me and air a grievance and be upset um, and have a challenge. Like I, I'm, I'm, I get that. The reason we are all in business, the reason all of us actually have jobs is to, is to resolve challenges, right? Like if there were no challenges, you probably wouldn't have a job. I wouldn't have a job, right? Like we would be like, Oh, Hey, nothing's going wrong. I don't even know if we need Trent. Like, <laughs> why, why is he even here? Right? What, a, what a cool world. Yeah. Right. I mean, and by the way, I don't know that world. Like who, who has that would never has challenges. Right. So we're, we have these roles and they need to be filled and there's lots of challenges in those roles. So we hire someone to manage those challenges for us. So I, I find it interesting that people go, Oh my gosh, Robert. I mean, you're not gonna believe this, but I have a challenge in the accounting department. Like, oh, hmm, that's good because you know, like everyone has one. In, in, like, and, and we're like surprised that a challenge came up, right? That it didn't go perfect. That it didn't all just seamlessly work together, right? Like, we're we're and, and it always throws me that that people are actually um, totally vexed by it. But at the end of the day, um, I think that what what's the requirement is is as leaders. We have to set that standard that we're not going to do that. So if someone comes to me with a complaint, I'll give them a few minutes. Hey, first of all, stop. Is there a challenge here that needs to be addressed? Well, I'm not sure. Robert, I'm just all upset. <laughs> okay. Well, Trent, how about you go back, think about it, 
why don't you come back here in two hours and, and let's talk about the challenge you're having and why don't you maybe offer up two solutions that are potential. They don't even have to be good, right? Like I, I don't require like, oh, that's a good solution. Like they can be awful. I do want some determined thought to it though. Like it's not like pie in the sky. You know what? Like, uh, you know what? If I just left the country, we'd never have this problem again. Like, okay, that's not happening. That's not a real solution. <laughs> you know, like stop, right? Um, you know, then I'm like back to the desk. You need a longer time to think about it. You know, might, might, might be an overnight on this one. You might <laughs> think a little deeper, right? But if, if we're just going to sit at our desk and all just offer complaints to everybody, it, it's not going to work. But, you know, here's, here's what I found is if I come in as a leader and I say, Hey, here's my complaints. Here's my problems. I can see the air just leave the room and the shoulders come down and the heads drop. And no, this is, this is, there's nothing inspiring about it. There's nothing. In fact, the immediate reaction to me, Robert, when you first tell me about your problems is, man, I don't know if I want to hear your problems because I've got my own. Right. Right. But the people that you surround yourself that really do love their role and, and enjoy resolving challenges, appreciate the fact that when I help, I feel good about myself. I feel good about what I offer this organization. And so you come to me now, Robert, and go, man, I got to tell you, Trent, I got a pretty significant challenge. And I, I think you're just the guy to help me. And I'm like, let me roll up my sleeves, Robert. What do we got, man? Like a challenge? Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm your in. guy. I'm here to help you. And let's get down to some challenges, man, because I love a challenge. And, 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 and I want to help you. And, and that's the standard that we've set around here. But there is a language. I mean, words matter. And Ooh. as an authority, as a leader, we have to, we really have to get that right in our organization. So where that really creeps in is when our leaders are, are, are the front runners of that complaining, that challenge, that always talking about problems. You Where know, have um, we seen that in our nation? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> like, you know, like when it happens, man, it, it, it filters down very Absolutely. And it, and it, and it's, you know, it's created division and it's created, but you can, you can see it in a, in a room. And like you mentioned, I think you had two things in there. That's really important. A, the no complaining rule, right. Which, which sets a standard for the whole team. It sets a standard for, for the, as a boundary that's like, you know, if, if the catchers turn into the first baseman and complaining, the first baseman's going like, what are you doing, dude? That's not what we do. Right. And, and so the standard has been set, like, this isn't what, this isn't how we talk. This isn't yeah. the language we use. And, and then, and then as a leader, you took the, you took the complaint and you forced him to, all right, if you're going to, if you're going to complain about this, I need you to figure out why it's the issue, right? What's the, what's the, the solution? What's the positive side? What's, what's the idea to turn this, turn this around. And those are two powerful, um, really bound, you know, it's a powerful boundary. And then it's also a, a powerful exercise to have to think of the opposite, right? What, what if this complaint is flipped over on its head. What does that look like? And yeah, that's the power to me. I mean, <laughs> you know, like I love, I love when there's conflict. I love it. Like well, it's, it's the only place growth happens. That's right. 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 So, and, and I don't love the conflict. I don't like that people are upset. I don't like what I like is what comes out the other side. Absolutely. Right? Is like, Hey, guess what? Two weeks from now, this is not going to be the issue that it is today. We're all going to be better for this. We're going to resolve this challenge. And, and, and when it comes up again, we're going to have some actual tools to address it. And we're going to be better for it. If and everybody's so really, committed to the same journey. <laughs> yeah. That, I mean, that's, that just really excites me. And so when I'm like, oh, there's a conflict. All right. Like, <laughs> let's go. And they're like, oh, my gosh. Like, what are you so excited about? This isn't good. Like, I mean, Wendy's being mean and it's the know, only Tom's place doing his job. And like, what are you so you know thrilled about? And I'm like, well, it's the only place the growth, growth happens. If everybody's happy all the time, there's no growth. Yeah. This right? discomfort is, is actually pretty good. Right. I mean, <laughs> we know the stress response, but you know, one, one of the things I'll give you a quick tip on what I really watch for when we talk about that complaining and leaders, I, I have a show called, you know, winners find a way. And so when we talk about that, 
It's it's from Chris McChesney and Sean Covey's book, The Four Disciplines of Execution, which is mm. winners Love when shown book. data that they are losing find a way to win, right? And I love that because uh, my whole life, like it's persevere, find a way like, Hey, this didn't work. You know, the other one. and we go right back to the, uh, you know, the, the uh, incandescent light bulb, right? Like, Hey, I, I got, you know, 6,248 ways. It doesn't work. I'll tell you that. Like, you know, and so I've, I've learned, you know, like what won't work. And so he keeps, you know, finding a way, but there's really big four loser behaviors. You know, winners find a way for losing behaviors come up very quickly, which is, and you've seen it in our leaders here. Um, one is make excuses. That's number one. We start making excuses. Oh, you know, man. Uh, hey, it was a really late night. And, you know, oh, man, I've got a, uh, my, my, my son missed the bus and I couldn't make the meeting. And, you know, like, man, we, we just, we're not organized. We're not ready. We make excuses of why I didn't. Two. We blame, right? Like, oh, you know what? It's Robert's fault. Yeah, you know, or, or Wendy's. I'm not sure which, but like, you know, it's it's somebody, right? It wasn't like, me. It's not me. All I know is not me, right? Um, the third thing we do is is when it gets tough, we quit. Yeah, I don't know. There's just not a solution. And you know, we're seeing this now more than uh more than I'm really comfortable with with the twenties that come in and go, Well, you know, hey, I Googled it and I didn't find it. So I don't know. I guess it doesn't exist. And you're like, wait, you're, you're, you're going to quit trying to resolve this because you just spent 18 seconds on Google and now it's over. Like, wait, what? So like quitting isn't really, you know, a great option. Uh, and then the last one is ignoring the data, right? Which has probably been some of the biggest, you know, travesty of, you know, what we've seen through the pandemic, I think, right? Is there so much data? First of all, the data wasn't good. We didn't vet the data. You know, we didn't qualify all these things. And you're just like, oh my goodness, man. I mean, it's, it's just, it's just loser quality, like at the 400 level. And you're not going to win that way. You're just not going to win that way. You, 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 Robert, you can't sit there and go, man, the ministry's going great. Three people came this Sunday. <laughs> you're like, I'm sorry, I, I, you know, that's a KPI we are measuring. Like how many actual attendees are coming into our ministry? Right? And it's like, uh, yeah, down from 300. Let's just keep on doing what we're doing because I think it's all working. Like don't ignore the data here, right? Like we've got to figure out like, hey, this is not right. It's not going the right direction. And and we're, and we know that, right, Robert? We know that when we went from 300 to 250, we're like, everybody knows. Well, there's, there's 50 less people here. Like every weekend and- Hey, at first it's like, hey, it's July, right? Like people on vacation, we're, we're going we're gonna to table that a little bit. But now it's September. Everybody's back to school and it's now down to 220 because we ignored it all, right? Yeah. Ignoring the data. And then, well, like you said, they, the data, the data is, well, the data is wrong or the data is this or, and, the, the thing that bothered me the most was, was really what you talked about earlier was trust and respect. Yeah. They created all these rules that showed they had no respect or trust yeah. in our ability as United States citizens, as United States adults yeah. to take care of each other. <laughs> like, Yeah. It's, it, you know, it's really challenging because, you know, trust is earned. Trust is built over time. Our, our media spends a ton of time building down and just tearing down people's values intellectual any any misstep physically mentally or morally is magnified 1000 x right like that's oh, what absolutely. we're great at we're great at magnifying the worst things possible <laughs> and so it's like man you know if if someone ever got into my life robert and and start <laughs> magnifying my missteps and my sins like a hey, news flash at 11. It's not going to be good, man. There's a lot of dirty <laughs> laundry, right? And and people will have a field day. And and I get that that you know, I've erred and um and I have to own that, right? But Well, uh, I'm I'm just thankful for the grace of of my savior. So Yeah, <laughs> the, right? The, I mean, the power, power right. of forgiveness it's, and I hope to right. extend the same that. love, same love and forgiveness to others. And so, uh, so I agree that that it's not it's not fair that <laughs> That gets magnified and, and multiplied. And all right. Well, and, so think, you and think about this, Robert, real quick. It's like, think about 
I mean, can you can you take a position? You've had a lot of it, but are you going to get the 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 trust of the entire nation in six months or three months? At all with this backdrop of just, I would call it slander of anything that Robert ever did wrong, right? Right. Um, because there's not a list of all the 100 or 250 things that you've just created so much value. You know, that's just seems to be not talked about, like hiking right. the ball, right? This is never talked about. It's yep. crazy. Yeah. No one wants to be the center. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We should all be the same. <laughs> well, everybody wants to be the quarterback, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. well, that? I don't know about everybody. You know, it's a lot of responsibility. <laughs> You're like going, it is absolutely. I get a lot of kids like, hey, you should try quarterback. And like, oh, no, like, <laughs> no. Uh, they just want the quarterback lifestyle. It's kind of like we all want to be Jeff Bezos entrepreneurs, but we don't want to do all the work he did. Oh, right. Yeah, we, we want his success for sure. Right? Oh, of course. Yeah. We just want his rocket. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you know, at least you got a little look. You know, you can pass for him. You know, you got a little look, you know, maybe, you know. Yeah. For the second time in, in my life, I got called Walter White again today. <laughs> oh, you <laughs> so funny. Good. I had I had two kids in McDonald's uh, about five years ago, just staring at me and staring at me. And their dad finally came over and he said, they think you're Walter White. I'm like, why on earth are your kids watching that show? Yeah, right. <laughs> like, right. What on earth? Oh. Uh, it's funny. But so what I what I wanted to talk about was was play and fun. Obviously, now you're in the midst of a, a you're in the midst of sports and sports are supposed to be fun. But obviously, at championship levels, they're working their tails off. Yeah. And so let's talk about incorporating play and fun into something that's supposed to be fun. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, do you watch Ted Lasso at all? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I like Ted Lasso. Like uh, it's a little racy. It's not exactly perfect for me, but um, what I do love is some things that happen in there. There's a ton of things about coaching in there. That's really important. And when he's talking about, you know, I don't know about wins and losses. I don't know how important they are to me. You know, like I love that, you know, like, uh, you know, sometimes you lose and you win and sometimes you win and you lose. Right. And uh, so I think a lot of people tie great organizations to success. And, you know, I think, you know, here, here's an example of what I think really good organizations do. Everyone falls down a step. Everyone comes back down the stairs, but really good organizations take five steps up and one step back, five step up, one step back. Now, you're trying to work with my organization. We're taking two steps up, three steps back, one step up, one step back, two steps up, one step back, three steps up, two steps back. You know, like you're like going, oh my gosh, you're never getting to the top of the staircase. Like it's going to take forever. And we're just constantly being battled by these challenges and getting pushed back. You know, that is not fun. That is not success of an organization. I mean, I have been involved in some great games and lost and just had an absolute ball, even though they're they're painful and, and they hurt, like they're memorable and they're some of the best moments. Uh, and I think that people really got to gather that there's just, you know, coming kind of coming back to this holistic approach, like what's all the values and the gratitude we get out of it? Like, um, yeah, maybe we didn't win, but. We won more than we did last year. You know, we had an average of 5,000 more people per game. Um, you know, I got I got healthier and, and my mental and physical and moral conditioning is better. Like all these things have come into play because of this. And so there's so much there's so much good that comes out of a a combined role of creating an organization with with one vision that's unified across that. I can't say enough about it. And I think the other thing is, is that understanding that today, Robert, I ask you as a 21, a 21 year old to be a pinch runner and do all this, but you know, at 27, you're going to be the multi-million dollar go-to. It's just not, that's not the role today. So even roles inside organizations will change. And, and part of it is let us get you prepared, Robert, for that next role. We need you as opposed to me putting you in a role where you're unlikely to be successful, lose your confidence and all these things happen. And I think that we have to be very aware of that as leaders um, as we go through, because the fun is seeing people be successful. And, um, and, and so 
you know, as, as the church is growing, the recognition of that, man, you know, our janitorial services are the best in this city and people are thrilled to be here. And we have kind of comments. In fact, hey, Bill or Tina, I pulled this out for you about five, you know, compliments on our website, testimonials to your great work here and your role. Like that is about having fun and rewarding people for them contributing to a great organization. And when you have a great organization that feels valued, you're going to be doing fine. Mm, good stuff. All right, Trent, what inspires you? Ooh, uh, I love, I love sports, right? I'm inspired by, um, overcomer stories. I'm, I'm, I'm inspired by people that face adversity. Uh, you know, we're studying, you know, the book of James right now. And man, um, it, you, you know, we're, we're back to James one, two, Count it as pure joy, brothers. <laughs> Wait a minute. You know, for people that go through trials, there's a shaping, there's a perseverance, and I am inspired by perseverance stories. Um, you know, and, and it's funny because I know what it says in the good book, and I know how many people I've talked to who went, this trial stinks. I don't want to be here anymore. Like, no one ever comes to me and goes, oh, I got to tell you, Trent, I'm, I'm just counting this as pure joy, Robert. You can't even, my business is going under. I'm going to file bankruptcy. Mm, it's just pure joy. I'm being <laughs> shaped, right, Robert? Like, like I mean, but no one is telling me that. And yet, we know there's polishing. This is why accountability is so important. You know, the, the most valuable stones in the world have been shaped and polished for so long. And, uh, we don't really always recognize that, that there are things going on around us. And if we, if we let it in and accept it, um, we're going to move through it and uh, around it over it. And I'm really inspired by the people who figure out, which is, which is why I have my show winners find a way, right? Because it is about one percenters telling their story about the challenges they've overcome. And, and, and I still get a kick when people go, Oh yeah. You know, they, they probably created, you know, Jeff Bezos probably never had any challenges along the way. Like, I'm like yeah, yeah, probably none at all. Right. Like, like you're not serious. Right. Like the, the challenge. That's how you grow. Like um, that's why James says count it joy, because that's the only place growth. Growth doesn't happen in happiness. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're content in happiness. Yeah. Like even a marriage, your marriage doesn't go through, you know, if everything's, you know, we never argue, we never have any issues, we never have any problem, and you don't have a real relationship. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of danger and comfort. In fact, you know, at my age now, it's funny, Robert. You get a kick out of this when when things get comfortable around, I get nervous. I'm like, <laughs> ooh, something's something's about to go down. <laughs> you know, That's because you had kids. It's not good. <laughs> if the house is quiet, the kids are doing something. Yeah, right, right. I'm, I'm waiting for a fire to break out or something, right? <laughs> Absolutely. All right, Trent, what's your big dream? Uh, my my big dream um, really is, uh, you know, to continue on the journey of my faith. I've learned so much in the last five years. I really feel like um, there's been a hyper learning of my faith. I got involved with a ministry called Every Man a Warrior, and I think that was really uh, important uh, to learn some some tools on my journey of faith. And I think that faith walk has been very important. And you know, I think what's going to be important to me in the end is that, you know, I've influenced and helped some people. Um, I've been, you know, a good husband and I've raised, you know, uh, children and, and been a good father to my five children. I mean, that's going to ultimately be what I measured on. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that's it. I mean, I'd, I'd love to have, you know, more financial success and a lot of other things. I think those are more worldly goals that, you know, I'm certainly going for, but um, they're not, they're not probably the things that are most important to me. No, but the, the financial success can lead to supporting more ministries and supporting yeah. more churches and supporting more growth. And, and, and all of those things still take money. Yeah. So, so it absolutely requires entrepreneurs that are willing to build their businesses to support, you know, the growth of the ministry around the world. Yeah. That's a, that's an inspiration to me too. Like, you know, the people that have exited, and now have the fortitude to continue very diligent hard work in mission work and ministry and, you know, in creating funding for other things through, through their uh, financial prowess and, and um, trusts and things that they've been doing. And so 
there, there's a lot of there's a lot of success of uh, folks that I know that have been great in business and and they've been inspired by that and really taken the next step of faith. And um, it's impressive. Nice. All right. You sat with a young entrepreneur having that drink for the last hour. You're going to leave him with Trent's words of wisdom. What would you share? Mm, that young entrepreneur, um, you know, enjoy the journey. Like enjoy it both in good and bad, right? I mean, uh, the tough times are, are what's going to shape you, right? It's uh, and 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 no one's immune, right? No one's immune to it. So you know, you really got to look back on the journey and uh, and and enjoy it through it. And the second thing I think, if I really had to address a young entrepreneur and they needed one skill, um, it's going to be along that spirituality because. The thing about spirituality, it takes self-discipline. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the biggest separator I've seen in the 1%, right? Is that they have a level of focus and fortitude, but it's all it's all fabricated and, and built into their self-discipline that can create it. And mm -hmm. if you don't have it, tons of great leaders, tons of, well, I should say tons of good leaders, that that can be very successful without it. But if you're going to be great, that's what it's going to take. Man, so good, Trent. Thank you so much for sharing with me today. Wow, what a what a blessing this conversation has been. I appreciate you. Thanks, Robert, for having me. For everybody, thanks uh, thanks for being with us, and I appreciate. Hopefully, there was some value for you. If you enjoyed the show, please like, subscribe, or leave a review. We have a free gift for you at addvaluemindset.com. That's addvaluemindset.com. We've collected some of the best mindset secrets shared by successful entrepreneurs on our podcast, and we want to give them to you for free. addvaluemindset.com. In our next episode, Bill Fairman and Robert share how the journey has left him wanting more control over his income. He had an understanding of loan numbers and learned how money works as an investor and loan provider building relationships and hanging out with people who have done it and are willing to share their wisdom. The biggest success has been in the ability to give back to the community and help others.